Good morning, Every Nation Reimser. So good to be with you. Welcome to all of you who are tuned in online. Today we are continuing our series here and now, Mastering Your Monday, learning how to bring the truths of the kingdom and the principles of the Bible into our everyday lives. The first time I felt overwhelmed was when I had been invited in high school to be part of a gifted students, a highly gifted students program that was held at another institution and we would go there and get special lessons to to help us um, kind of express our highly giftedness. I feel like my name got somehow into that pile inadvertently. I was very surprised to be called to this program, but nonetheless, I went along and we had the opening day. We were ushered into a classroom, a computer lab and I sat down at a desk either someone to the right and someone to the left we were waiting for the lecturer to arrive so feeling a little bit nervous and just a little bit out of place I turned to the person on my right and asked them what are you here to study and they said with great gusto they are going to study high energy physics and then they went on to tell me all the brilliant things they were going to discover and all the all that they knew about high energy physics to this date you know Every now and then I heard a word like but, and, or the, so I knew they were speaking in English, but every other word was completely unintelligible to me. I was like so shocked and overwhelmed. It's like, how, how am I going to be in the same class as someone like this who already knows all that, that I have not a clue about? So I thought, well, maybe that's an anomaly. Maybe there are some normal people in this class. I turned to my left and there was someone and I asked them, what? what are you going to study? And they said they were going to study the history of philosophy. That sounded okay. I said, oh, what is the history of philosophy? And then they began to tell me. You know, most of the words they said, I could understand. The problem was when they put it in a sentence in that order, it was just confusing and overwhelming and far beyond my knowledge. I sat there dumbfounded. You know the feeling, overwhelmed. How am I going to cope in this scenario? Scenario. How am I going to compete, so to speak, or at least, at least compare with these people when, when these lectures happen? Am I going to know anything or am I going to look stupid? I have to be honest. I took the coward's way out. I told everyone to my right and left that I was just going to go to the bathroom, packed up everything into my bag, headed out, phoned my mom and said, get me out of here. And that. That would have been the last, except my mom was a wise woman and she sent me back and I ended up doing more there. But, but nonetheless, that was a feeling of being overwhelmed. Another time when I feel overwhelmed is when I, when I survey the need that is around us today. You know what it's like. You walk in the Joburg streets, you stop at the robots, robots and you see the people begging, the, the destitute, the, the poor, the, the addicted, and you, you see the need around you. And when I see all of that and I, and I realize the enormity of what needs to happen to bring God's kingdom in the areas that we are, I feel overwhelmed because I realize I don't have capacity to fix it. I'd love to just fix it, but I can't fix it. And I feel overwhelmed. But I've learned two things. That being overwhelmed is a sign that my connection to Jesus is too narrow. In other words, I need more of his power, more of his knowledge, more more of him with me, leading me and guiding me. The second thing that I learn is that being overwhelmed means that my connection to life-giving real human relationships is being eroded. Just like in that class, I, I felt a disconnect to the people around me and it caused me to be overwhelmed. Felt like I didn't fit in, I didn't belong. And I've learned as a consequence of these things that when, when I experience great levels of stress or need, I need more time with Jesus, not less. The first thing we want to push out of our diary when we're feeling overwhelmed is our time with the Lord. And, and I've learned over time that actually that's the thing that I need to increase to broaden my relationship and my, my knowledge of Jesus Christ, my understanding of him on my feeling of being connected to him. The second thing that I've learned is that when I feel high levels of stress or need around me, that 
that I need more time in life-giving church friendships, not less. I need more time with people who get me, more time with people that I get, more time with people that call me up to something higher, more time in the fun and fellowship of people who are running after the same culture as I am. You know, uh, a quick perusal of the hashtag self-care on Instagram will give you a lot of pictures of well-toned people, mostly in sportswear, sometimes eating delicious food that defies their well-toned body. You know what I'm saying? Like if you eat, th eat that, you certainly wouldn't have that body. But nonetheless, there you see them. And it's also filled with pithy sayings, like, like smart sayings and advice for taking care of yourself. Some of that advice, advice is really good, like, like switch off your electronic devices, spend more time outdoors, but some of it is just crazy. One recommendation said this, that we are to declare daily over our lives, I am open and ready for large sums of money to be given to me. Thank you, universe. Of course, the universe is not listening, so I don't know where anyone's going to get with that declaration. So in light of all this barrage of information about how to take care of yourself, should we not look at the source of all life? How did Jesus Christ himself take care of himself? Well, we have been talking about in this series that crazy day that Jesus had. All the Gospels recorded it. it was, it's the only day other than his crucifixion that is recorded by all the Gospels. So clearly it made an impression on the writers of the New Testament. And they all record this day and, and Jesus' reactions within this day, this 24-hour period that was chock-a-block with need, with, with experience, with, with fantastic miracles, but also with a pull on Jesus, an emotional pull on Jesus continuously. You remember the day started when Jesus lost his cousin. His cousin was beheaded in a very cruel and terrible way. And the day went on with him trying to get alone to be by himself. And the crowds followed him and he preached and taught the crowds out of compassion and healed their sick, even though he was dealing with deep personal loss. And then they were hungry and so he fed 5,000 with uh, two fish and five loaves. And then he goes up the mountain again and he sends his disciples off in the, at the, in the evening to cross the lake. And then he comes walking to them on the water in the middle of the night and they get over to the other side. And yeah, it's a crazy day. It's a crazy day by any standards. How did Jesus exhibit self-care in the craziness of this day? Well, John 6 verse 15 talks about how at the end of the time that he had fed those 5,000, done that incredible miracle, it says, perceiving that they were to come, about to come and take him by force to make him king, Jesus withdrew again to the mountain by himself. You know, immediately it becomes obvious that, that Jesus was guarding him, his own soul from false adulation, from, from a sense of um, being called to do something or being pulled by the need or the, or the desires of the people to something that God his Father had not called him to. God had not called him to be an earthly king. That would have been far beneath what he was actually called to. But you know, the pull of people's expectations can, can often pull us into things that we're not actually called to. Call, drives us to behave in ways that actually defy the well-being of our own souls. And Jesus knew that and he immediately said no and withdrew to a lonely place to be by himself, to recalibrate, to deal with the loss that he'd experienced that day in the form of his cousin dying, but also to, to deal with the the hecticness and the debrief with his heavenly father, take time to just talk through what had happened. What does his response need to be? How does he need to feel about this? To encounter his heavenly father in solitude to refresh his own soul. Also, Matthew 14 from verse 22 describes the same moment. It says this, immediately he made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side of the lake while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. 
When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's early in the morning, he came to them walking on the sea. You know, the loss that Jesus had experienced in in losing his cousin is, is a very familiar thing to us in this world. So many of you have experienced loss. What I notice about Jesus, however, as I spoke in the beginning, is that when he was going through tough times, he, he broadened his relationship with his Heavenly Father, not narrowed it. He spent more time with his Heavenly Father. Also, he, he pushed through obstacles to be with the people of God, to be with his people. Imagine walking across a sea in a storm to get back to your people. Jesus exhibited those those things that we have been talking about in perfect clarity. I want to talk about three tools. He may not have called them this, but three tools that that I see Jesus using as he takes care of his soul. First of all, he used God's hammer. Then he used God's walk and then he used God's people. I know you saying, what on earth are those things? Watch, listen, here we go. God's hammer. There's a scripture in Jeremiah 22 verse 39. It says this. It's one of my favorites because it's, it's so powerful and energetic and so, so full of life. It says this, is not my word, God speaking, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces. You know, one of the things that happens to me when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm just feeling under my circumstances, when I'm feeling like everything's getting on top of me, is that I, I feel my, the, my emotions either becoming over the top or I just feel like my heart shuts down and I become as cold as stone inside. And, and I'm trying to feel, but all I can think about is just, just take care of yourself, take care of yourself. But you see, there's there's a power in God's word that comes into situations like that, where his word comes and breaks the hard heartedness that's in our souls. But it also breaks the stronghold of darkness that is about us and sets us free, brings life. It's, it's, a, it's a gentle action to us, but a violent action against the forces of darkness. You remember that scene? Marvel Comics movies. You remember that scene when Thor's hammer goes flying across the universe and slams into the ground next to Loki. You remember it. And the earth cracks and quakes and shards of light come screaming out into the darkness. And the folly of Loki is vanquished for a moment until a sequel, that is. This scene pales in comparison to the glory transforming power, blinding, cleansing light and impact that happens when God's word comes pounding across eternity into your heart. We underestimate the power of God's word to transform us, to heal us, to establish us, to make, to make sense of the world. Shards of light erupt and darkness flees and the kingdom rearranges your thinking to reflect heaven when you take time to read his word, allow time for his word to enter your heart. The great prayer that Jesus prayed, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, is so realized as God's word comes into our heart because we are transformed into the image of heaven, into the, the likeness of, of the person we were always meant to be. Change happens in us, but at the same time, that change tends to influence our environment and like that hammer, just influences the world. Now, now, just a disclaimer I want to make. I have no interest in Norse, Norse mythology, which is Thor and Loki and all of that. I don't believe in it for a second, but I love the picture of the power of that hammer that he, that he carries. And I, I know that God's word is so much greater than that, but that gives us a small picture of God, what God's word can do. A statement that I heard someone make recently that really rocked my world. He said this, and I see the truth of it coming out of the Bible. He said, when we replace our mind with the word, we replace our mind with God's mind. When we replace 
our mind with the word. We replace our mind with God's mind. What's that, what's that saying is when, when we allow the word to put the truth of God's thinking into our minds and it replaces our thinking, suddenly we have the mind of Christ. Things look different. We're able to assimilate our world in a new way. I want to ask you this question. What are you wearing? Headphones or hearing aids? Oh, you can post on the, the chat all the things you're wearing. That would be really cool. But I guess what I mostly want to know is in life, are you wearing headphones or hearing aids? Have you ever tried to get someone's attention who is wearing headphones? It's almost impossible. You have to dance around. You have to finally take the headphone off their ear in order to get their attention. You see, there, there are certain things in life that act like headphones, that prevent the Word of God from getting into our heart. Those are things like hours and hours in front of Netflix. Those are things where we allow the, the value and the ways of the world to be so real to us that we are, we are, they almost drown out the voice of our Heavenly Father. They, they might be the anxieties, the anxious thoughts of our own hearts. They might be the, the, the unceasing need or cries of the people around us. They, they might just be our own, our own sense of hopelessness or powerlessness, whatever it is, whether it's an external thing or an internal thing. There are headphones that keep us away from the, the Word of God. God is calling us to set those things aside, to push down your anxious thoughts for a moment, to set aside the need of the people for a moment, to set aside the, the entertainment that is crowding into your mind and say, okay, God, I need time with you alone to hear your voice. Let it be the loudest and most prominent voice in my heart. Alternatively, we can wear hearing aids. What do I mean by that? I, I, we, we can put things into our life that magnify the sound of God's voice to us, that act like hearing aids that allow the voice of God to become clearer and clearer to us. Spiritual hearing aids are things like time alone with Jesus, time reading our Bibles, praying in tongues, prayer, being around life-giving relationships, people who speak truth to you. These are the things that help us to hear God's word more clearly. You know, recently I was talking to a friend and, and she, was, she was rightly bemoaning the fact that she'd heard a story about a young child somewhere further north in Africa from us who had been born in a place where there was very little medical attention, but it was born with its in intestines on the outside of its body. And of course, with no medical attention, this was a, a grueling and very painful little life for this child and a very short life for this child. And she was bemoaning the fact that these kinds of things happen in our world. And oh my word, if you ever, if your heart ever gets to the place that you don't bemoan, you don't feel bad about the terrible things that are happening in this, in this world, then, then somehow we have lost the heart of God because He hates these things more than us. He cries and mourns over these things more than we do. But you see, part of us receiving God's word is that the answer to these problems lies not in angels coming down from heaven and doing stuff. It lies in a church empowered by the spirit of the living God, carrying his word and his ways, knowing his truth, empowered by his spirit, walking into these situations and bringing his love, bringing his ability, bringing his power, bringing his comfort. Guys, so much rests on us being transformed by the power of God's word, your environments, the well-being of your family, the state of this nation depends on you and me being faithful to broaden our relationship with Jesus to the point that it's a highway of his word flooding our hearts and it's it's allowing that word to come out from our mouths and be a hammer into society, breaking the darkness into pieces, smashing those rocks of, of fear, anxiety, poverty, and, and bringing the light of his truth in his word. This is who we call to be. Let, let's not settle for anything less. Romans 12 verse 2 says this, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing and perfect will. 
You know something, not, not everything that seems true to you is true. In other words, when we are overwhelmed, so, so many thoughts come to our minds. Where is God? Has God left me? I will never make it. This, this is too much. I can't cope. These are all, these are all lies that, that feel true to us in our minds. But when we spend time with God and we allow him to transform us and his word comes into our heart, it, all, those, all those thoughts are replaced by the truth because God's word is true. Not everything that seems true to you, especially in a state of being overwhelmed, not everything that seems true is true. God's word is true. Allow it to settle in your heart. Reform your thinking. Re recalibrate your emotions. Let's look at God's walk. You know, if I were Jesus, honestly and truly, if I had been up on that mountain trying to recalibrate after the loss of my cousin and the busy day I'd had, I'd send my disciples across the lake. It's getting dark. A huge storm comes up, the Bible tells us, and, and the disciples are straining against uh, this, this incredible wind and storm that is on the lake. And if I, I knew that I had to get across the lake, my father had told me I need you across the lake with your disciples. And if I went down to the edge of that lake and saw, well, it was kind of dark, but heard the moaning wind and the, heard the crashing waves, you know, I would look back across my Bible history and I would say, Moses stood across from a giant sea. He extended his staff, it parted, and he walked across on dry land. I'm the Messiah. How much more should I be able to do that? And I, I would be commanding that sea to open up before me. But Jesus didn't do that. It's so interesting to me. I don't know what kind of conversation happened between him and his father, but clearly he, he was not going to part the water. He was actually going to walk on it. He was going to face that storm every step of the way. He was, he, instead of trusting God for a parted sea, he was going to trust a God, that would, God for a, a sea that would be hard under his feet. He was going to trust that the wind and waves that were, were wildly swirling around him would not affect him that, and that he would be able to walk through that storm untouched. Sometimes God parts the water for us and sometimes we have to walk on it, storm and all. Both are God's miraculous intervention in our life. You know, the matriculant who gets a scholarship to study for his dream job with guaranteed employment afterwards, that's a miracle. That's a sea parted, bam, that's, that's fantastic, a clearly obvious miracle of God. But the teen who works two jobs to pay for his varsity and managed to get good grades, gets a mediocre job, but then works himself up from there that's just as much God's miracle. That's God taking his hand and saying, we're going to walk across the sea together. You're going to, you're going to make it and you're going to thrive and you're going to be excellent. Just put your foot one step in front of the other. Just listen to me. Every place your foot treads, I will make it hard underneath it. I will give it to you. I, I will cause you to inherit this territory by virtue of my faithfulness as we walk together across the storm. Both of those are just as much miracles. Sometimes he parts the water and sometimes we walk over it. And here's the thing, stop comparing yourself to the other person that, that God parted the sea for and you having to walk over the storm. It's just God, God, these are both miracles. Thank you for that parted sea and thank you for the storm walking ability. Let me, let me follow the path that God has for me because another time he's going to part the water for you and that person's going to have to walk over the, the water and in the storm. Let's, let's focus on what God is doing with us in the midst of the storm and say, yes, your way is good. No matter what it is, I'll trust you. Last one, Jesus pressed into being with his people, with God's people, with his disciples. There's a really beautiful story in Mark 14, starting verse 32. It's a story of when Jesus is just about to go to the cross. Uh, he's in the garden of Gethsemane and he prays and he's clearly wrestling with what he knows is coming. And he asks his disciples to come with him and he says, especially, especially to Peter, James and John, that they to come with him and, and be with him in his time of need. I love that because you know what? The Messiah of the universe facing his biggest struggles knew that he couldn't do it alone. He needed the support of his disciples. His humanity needed loving friends around. Romans 12, 
verse 3 to 5 says this, For by the grace given me, I say to you, to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In accordance with the measure of faith God has given you, just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we who are many form one body and each member belongs to all the others. In other words, to think more highly of yourself means to ignore the fact that you need people. To, to discount the grace of God is to ignore the fact that you need loving, life-giving relationships. This portion of scripture says that just as a body functions by the arm being connected to the shoulder, being connected to the chest, that the blood flowing, the ears hearing, the eyes working, all of it together forms one life-giving whole. So the church is like that. We all need one another. We need not just need one another, but we need to be connected to one another so that life flows from one of us to the other. And I know, I know, I know you're a fantastic person and all those tough people you have to relate to in church. Oh my word, I know how hard it is when that person irritates you and they don't say the right thing and it's just hard and they need stuff from you and the relationships are hard and you have to grind through them. But I want to tell you it's worth it because one day you're going to be on the other side. And all of us need one another in our time of need. And we need one another in our time of strength so that we have something to give our strength to. Jesus is all you need is a very common phrase that runs around the church. But I want to propose to you that it's a false statement. Indeed, Jesus is all you need for salvation. There is nothing else. You you are saved by his grace alone. There's, There's nothing else. You exercise faith in Jesus and he saves you. That's, that's all you need, nothing else. No works, no clever sounding prayers, no, no um, it, I don't know, no flagellation, no crying. You can do all those things if you want to, but all you need is Jesus Christ. However, to live a successful Christian life, you will need the body of Christ. You'll need your brothers and sisters. It's designed that way. God designed it that way, that to live successfully on this earth, you will have to be in community. So we've talked about God's hammer, which is his word impacting our hearts, transforming us, changing us. This is a tool for living through the hectic times. We don't need less time with Jesus. We need more time with Jesus, more time in his word when we face overwhelming circumstances. We've talked about God's walk, how how God's walk for us sometimes means he parts the seas, but sometimes he calls us to walk over the storm. And both of them are his miracle and both of them will glorify him and both of them will satisfy us and lead us, lead us to the victory that we desire. We've also talked about how in order to be strong in times of stress and need, we need to be connected to God's people. We need to be in community with, with all, all of who the church is. It's good parts, it's bad parts. We need to just be in there living out life together. Again, I stress that when stress and need increase, you will need more time with Jesus, not less, and more time with God's people, not less. I'm going to close with a testimony that really thrilled me. There is a gentleman in our Every Nation Joburg world. His name is Ntlantla Similani, and he is in the corporate world, and he is a coach a Christian, a devout man, a a profound intercessor. I pray with him from time to time. He he recently told the story how a a particular woman came to him for coaching in the the corporate space. She was part of her company. She had had been performing worse and worse. She'd got terrible performance reviews. As a result, she was at the risk of losing her job. And because of that, her, her bosses were taking advantage of her because they knew she was on a knife's edge. They were giving her impossible tasks, phoning her up late at night to do things. And she knew she could never say no. So she was in a very miserable, depressed and, and hard pressed place. She came to him and, and confessed that she was a follower of Jesus Christ. And he said, well, together we are, we are, we are the church in action. Let's pray and believe. He went away and prayed and said, God, how, how do I help this woman? He said to her, he said to him, excuse me, that, that she was not hearing his voice. So he came back to her and he said, okay, um, 
prayed and he said, what do you feel like God is telling you? And so she said, I feel like God is telling me this and that. So he said, okay, we'll just go out and do that. So she went out and did it, came back the next week. And he said, how did it go? He said, well, so she, he asked her again, so what is God saying to you? And she shared something else and he said, well, go and do that. She went and did that time and time again. She would come back to him and he would ask, what is God saying? And she would say tentatively, I think he's saying this. She, he would say, go out and do it. She would do it. And with it, within 18 months, um, she had become so invaluable to the um, the company that her her income had quadrupled. In other words, it had gone, it had multiplied four times. In addition, she received most valuable worker in the company an award. And as she got to this place, she decided she didn't want to work for that company anymore. And she went to them and said, I'm resigning. And they did everything to keep her because she was so valuable to the company. She went from about to being fired to being so valuable. She went about just about losing her ink, went from just about losing her income to quadrupling her income simply by listening to the word of God, that hammer that slams into our hearts, that comes and comforts us. She went right from, right from on the precipice of disaster to, to such a, a seemingly successful environment by listening to the word of God, by learning to assimilate God's word in her heart. In addition, it happened when Christians connected, when life-giving relationships happened, when a relationship happened where someone could call her up, could see who she really was and call her up to a higher place in him. My friends, when stress and need increase, you will need more time with Jesus, not less, and more time with God's people not less. Lord Jesus, I want to pray for each person listening. Lord God, this testimony that we've just heard, I pray for people who are on the, on the brink of disaster, Lord God, that, that you would begin to speak to them and they would begin to follow your word, Lord God, and they, they would see that, that hardship turn into a triumph, Lord God. Father God, I'm praying for people that are overwhelmed and stressed, Lord God, that Father God, as they spend time with you, you would, you would nurture them and, and heal their hearts, Lord God. I'm asking, Lord God, that as a church, you would bind us together. Lord God, people who are on the outskirts, you would bring them close, Lord God, that our relationships would call one another up, would remind one another of the greatness and the goodness that God wants to do in our lives, Lord God. I'm asking, Lord God, that you would set things right, that you'd make this church shine like a beacon of light in this dark world. That in turn, as we assimilate the hammer of God's word, that we would wield the hammer of God's word. That into, into broken situations, we'd come with the love and life of Jesus Christ and speak the words that destroy the enemy's encampment and bring about a release for people lost away far from Jesus and bring them near. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Amen and amen. As we close, I just also want to pray. I feel like there, there are some people here that are watching that are battling with COVID. I feel like I want to pray for you and just, just see God break the back of that infection in your body. I also, I also feel like there are some people who are facing financial decisions that are very, very difficult. And I'm, asking, I'm going to be asking God for the, His wisdom to come upon you. And last of all, I, I feel like there are family relationships that are really battling right now. And I feel like God wants to bring about a restoration in those relationships. So if that's you, won't you just put your hand to your heart or just indicate in some way that you're receiving from the Lord. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I speak to every person watching who has COVID, indeed any infection. Lord God, and right now I just break the back of that. Lord God, I speak right now your truth, your word, Word, that by your stripes we have been healed, that you sent your word and you healed us, that we forget none of your benefits, that you heal all our diseases, that Father God, you are the one who became a curse for us, that we would not have to suffer under the curse of the Lord. So I speak to these infections and I command you to die before the word of the Lord. I command you to be dispensed and to leave, to flee to flee before the presence of God as we submit to his word. And Father God, I ask in each person's life right now that healing and life would come to their bodies. Those, that fever would break, that pain would leave, that lethargy would be gone. Lord God, that breathing would be restored, that every part of their body that has been damaged by this infection would be restored. In Jesus' name, would be recreated. You renew our youth as eagles. 
Psalms also says, Lord God, and I speak that into their bodies, renewed youth. Lord God, I speak right now to everyone facing those decisions. Lord God, I those financial decisions. I ask for the mind of Christ to be upon them, Lord God. Right now, I'm reminded of that testimony of that man who was recently, a couple of days ago that Andrew spoke to, who who was at the brink of, of having to sell everything because he couldn't take pay his bills and unexpectedly he got a financial payout from a previous forgotten pension plan that he'd been a part of and Lord God I'm asking for those kind of solutions to come into these people's lives unexpected financial windfalls but at the same time wisdom beyond their years in experience to make the right decisions to do the right things with the money they do have with the assets they do have so look so that so that they will be taken care of, their families will be taken care of, and they will have enough to bless the people around them. And last of all, Lord God, I just pray for broken relationships, Lord God. P where people in families, Lord God, there's strain and there's difficulty, I pray for a restoration. Holy Spirit, come and pour the oil of your presence upon them in Jesus' name. And Lord God, I ask right now, Father God, that where those relationships, even in the church, have been strained, I ask that they'd be restored and brought back to beautiful fruitfulness. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and amen. God bless you.